Welcome back to Outside 2022. Now, please welcome our next speaker, Thomas Rayner. Thomas Rayner is a registered landscape architect, teacher, and author living in Arlington, Virginia. Thomas, a leading voice in ecological landscape design, has designed landscapes for the U.S. Capitol grounds, the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial, and the New York Botanical Garden, as well as over 100 gardens from Maine to Florida. Thomas serves as a principal for the landscape architectural firm Fido Studio in Washington, D.C. His recently published book, Planting in a Post-Wild World, was selected by the American Horticultural Society as one of the 2016 Books of the Year. Good afternoon. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here today, and I, I just, uh, just for being here for a couple days, um, uh, I'm just so uh, inspired by what this conference is doing. Um, I talked with uh, Tim and uh, several others kind of before coming down here, and I was really blown away by the whole premise of the, con uh, the conference. I do a lot of uh, conferences and symposiums, sometimes 10 to 20 a year, and you know, the thing about conferences is they always segregate uh, different disciplines away. You know, the landscape architects go to theirs, the arborists go to theirs, and this is one of the first I've truly seen. And of course, they all go to the different conferences and they talk about how we need to talk more, you know. And this is one of these very few things I've ever seen that really brings together not only kind of people within the green industry, but also the development community, uh, academia, and everything else. So uh, I, I'm just so uh, honored and grateful to be here and, and for uh, this opportunity to um, to see what the change is happening here, uh, which is something I'm very passionate about as well. Um, though I'm talking today uh, about planting and design landscapes, and the title of the talk I decided to give is Rebuilding Abundance. And, and, and really the context of what uh, I'm interested in is, is very similar to what we've been talking about kind of this whole time. This is very similar to a place where I grew up outside of Birmingham, Alabama. And when you look at kind of the, the juxtaposition of our natural and semi-natural spaces to conventional suburban development, I mean, it's really jarring in many ways. And as a child growing up in, you know, kind of this area, I can tell you where I wanted to be. You know, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't in the lawn that the developers, uh, the, the salespeople said I would be playing in. It was in this, you know, uh, uh, amazing uh, wild space in those areas. And so, of course, the nature of both the wild spaces that we have and our developed spaces are changing. We're, ch we're, we're asking different questions about why does this have to be like this at the same time that we're losing so much of this, right? So the two questions I think this is prompting and, and part of what I'm structuring my talk around is to try to answer kind of two big questions. And it kind of goes back to those two spaces. One is how do we preserve and rebuild the biodiversity of our wild places? I mean, this is a much bigger conservation kind of global perspective uh, issue on this. And at the same time, how do we make the green cities and the green developments of tomorrow, right? So, and really, how do we garden the wild, to put it in a very simpler way, and how do we wild our gardens uh, in one way or the other, right? So, to me, that is the essence of how we're going to have to deal with, with climate change and the biodiversity loss, the two big crises that we're dealing now. is kind of guarding the wild, taking responsibility and inserting ourselves to preserve as much biodiversity as possible because our wild spaces can't do it on its own anymore. You know, left alone, these fragments cannot function in the same way as they could before. So they need us in both ways. And then, and then also kind of understanding these questions through this really complex, and I think this conference has highlighted this so well, this complex matrix of, it's not just about designers or nursery growers or the academia, it's about really kind of how we all contribute to the different pieces of the puzzle. So as I was a bit in Florida here, and I come to Florida, uh, many times you have family in North Florida, but one of the things that was always fascinating to me about the, the Floridian landscape is how absurd it is. <laughs> um, there's much about kind of, I'm not talking about the design landscape. You know, so much about the Florida design landscape, and it's also true, I've, just to uh, give a shout out, the American suburban landscape is also absurd in, in many ways. So part of what I, I want to kind of point out in, in this way, you know, so much of, I think, the, the, the Floridian, like what we do in our design landscapes is influenced by Roberta Burley Marx and it's influenced by, you know, kind of cliched ideas of, uh, of resorts. Uh, it's really about selling a fantasy, 
You know, it's really influenced heavily by Disney, uh, by resorts, by kind of selling people a fantasy, and, and it definitely trickles down into uh, uh, residential development as well. But the thing about, the, the reason I'm saying this, the reason I bring this up is because this is a cultural construct, and cultural constructs can be changed. We are selling people a fantasy for landscapes, and, and I think there's something actually very powerful. I know it sounds absurd to say we're going to have a fantasy about what our landscapes are, what they remind us of, but there's something powerful about that that the, the marketers understand. You know, we want a fantasy to be in. We want our landscapes to remind us, to give us a feeling of a place. And so, in many ways, by realizing that the landscapes that we live in are fantasies, we can change the fantasies. We can replace it with a different fantasy of something else. So, instead of kind of another version of a, a you know, Central American, Brazilian uh, exotic garden, or the absurdity of so much lawn, as we've all talked about, and kind of, you know, and, and just the... the I, I, the last panel was excellent, especially, I think, hearing just how insane uh, the maintenance of lawn is, right? I mean, it was really kind of highlighted the absurdity of that. When we're surrounded here in Central Florida with places like this, now that is a fantasy, right? This is a fantasy. You know, th this, is a, this is the local landscape is really inspiring. Now, I'm not talking about just kind of the, the, some of the semi-natural ones have gotten invaded, and, but when you look at some of the native plant communities in their, their idealized form, really inspiring places. Or in Florida, it's filled with some of these. So it's really just about kind of, instead of kind of the Brazilian fantasy or the resort fantasy or something else, we're, we're kind of substituting kind of a more authentic uh, Floridian, I think, fantasy for what these landscapes can be. So, uh, so that is kind of what inspires uh, us in a lot of our work, is, is looking back at the natural references and then trying to understand how can we take a wild space and bring it in to a design landscape. It's not easy. You know, it, it is about kind of distilling and amplifying and turning up the volume. So that's really what I want to kind of talk about uh, today. Just as a little bit of intro to kind of who I am professionally, um, I started a, a firm with uh, my partner, Cloudy West, and my wife, uh, Melissa Rayner. A few years ago, uh, I've been in practice for about uh, 20 years. Uh, but Fido is a really dedicated firm to bridging the gap that we felt uh, between horticulture, ecology, and landscape architecture. We really felt the gap uh, as landscape architects. Uh, my, my partner, Claudia, has been in the world of horticulture, uh, worked in, as a grower for, for many, many years. And just like not being able to take a diverse planting plan and being able to source it, it's a huge problem, right? And not finding a contractor who understood how to install thousands of plugs of perennials, you know, with, without looking at us like we're crazy. So the only way for us to kind of like really understand how we can plant differently, how we can actually get more biodiversity in these gardens was to kind of create our own practice and really kind of work around uh, a, a different a group of contractors that can really help us to get, uh, achieve a vision. Uh, that's Claudia, uh, Melissa Rayner, the, um, and, and uh, the chump on the, the right, you recognize him. <laughs> Uh, but one of the big things that I think as a firm that we're really dedicated to doing is changing planting design away from object-based planting. When we think about planting design, we're trying to think about designing plants as systems. Thinking about planting is more like, and this is true in all the wild spaces, plants work like engines. But in traditional horticulture, it's like taking apart all the pieces of an engine and laying them out ornamentally and then work, wondering why it doesn't work. And some of the absurdities of these conventional landscapes and why they require so much mulch, as you heard, why they have to have pre-emergent herbicide to be sprayed on them, just because, why? Because what's going to happen? Plants are going to grow. Plants are going to do what plants want to do, right? We've, we're missing a gap in that system, and therefore we have to replace it with mulch and pre-emergent herbicides because plants want to be a system. They want to work, and the weeds are just trying to fill in a gap that we've left in that planting right, in many ways. So we are trying to think differently about approaching plants more like systems that they grow naturally. Now, our design systems are nowhere near as complex or as good as the, what nature does. You know, th these are, these are uh, uh, much simpler versions of that, but they're still trying to understand the principles of how uh, a mixed planting can actually function like a system so that it has all of the, a lot of the ecological benefits that we really want a, a green planting to have. So, in terms of planting design and, and conventional horticulture, I just want to highlight a few of the ways in which this is a big shift. One conventional approach is that plants are arranged as individual objects. And in our, the work that we're trying to do and encourage people to do is to do plants in intermingled populations. So we're actually designing plants to touch, 
to interact, to go together. Instead of always focusing on us placing plants, we want to create plantings where plants can place themselves. And while in the wild, plants choose where they want to go. And it's this selection that plants have. Not that they actually choose. I'm anthropomorph anthropomorphizing plants a little bit. But through natural selection, through where seed falls, plants fall into the places in which they're most likely to, to survive. And if they don't, they die. So it's that self-selection that a plant can kind of find its place where it's going to be the happiest is, is something we've totally eliminated from our garden spaces. You know, if we don't do it in a pre-designed way, then, and they're not happy, and sometimes they're not. You know, they don't have the chance to do that. Um, so planting uh, plan is the dominant way of doing design, whereas we're thinking more about plant list and matrixes and uh, uh, is the dominant mode. Uh, the whole idea around site preparation that we would eliminate the stresses of a site, we try and embrace the stresses as an asset. So instead of adding irrigation, uh, you know, adding a lot of compost, adding a lot of stuff, you know, the whole idea about site preparation is we want to change uh, the environment into something more like a new, more like potting soil that we can grow anything we want from all over the world, right? But plants don't want generic soil. Plants want specific soil. Plants want high pH or crazy low pH. Plants want really wet soil or really dry soil, depending on where they evolved to go from. They don't want something generic. They want something really specific. So if we can take the stresses that are inherent in that site and understand the right palette for that, the inputs go incredibly down, right? So it's a very different way of thinking about it. Instead of thinking about soil fertility as always being good, we think about soil fertility as being the enemy. And I'll explain more about that later. And instead of them, every different plant getting different maintenance, we're thinking about the whole mix getting one you know, set of actions so that crews can come in. Uh, and I love the, the image uh, that Jimmy was showing earlier of mowing, kind of mowing a whole mix. You know, that, that's the way we're thinking about this stuff. It's not that this plant gets a little bit of fungicide, this plant gets a little bit more water. We come in and do a, do a mix, they all get mowed one time a year, they all take the same maintenance or else it doesn't do. So the maintenance levels go way down. So it's, it's, it's definitely kind of a big mind shift from conventional horticulture in many ways. And when we're looking at wild systems, when we're looking at natural inspirations, a big part of what we're looking for is how can we hack some of these things? I mean, if you look at these the different wild inspirations, we can't always take the exact plants that are in these places, but we can look at like the dry shade you see in the upper left and say, like, what are these ones that can really grow? What are the plants that really love to grow in dry shade? Because there's always a, an oak, you know, a dry shade in a, in a yard or a landscape. Like, what are the populations that can actually deal with that? Or floodplain communities, like you see the upper right, that can handle periodic scouring and then summer droughts. You know, that's a lot of urban challenges. It's flooding for a portion of the year, and then, then it has to deal with droughts. So the floodplain communities have some of these natural um, resiliencies to some of these, or granite rock outcroppings, which is very similar to urban plazas, or even just the weeds, urban weeds, and like how they fill in so quickly. Uh, this was an image I took outside of, uh, on, on my walk. Uh, I went and counted the number of species of weeds growing on the, just kind of spontaneously emerging my neighbor's uh, uh, health strip out there. I counted 32 different species in this area, way more biodiverse, way more plants growing in this area than in any part of my garden per square foot, right? So here I have a garden where I'm trying to grow for biodiversity, and here is a <laughs> bunch of Eurasian weeds that, that's sprouting up, you know, that, that has more biodiversity than anything in my garden. Now, I'm not saying it's as good as some of the natives or the, this is what we should embrace, but I'm just saying this is what plants want to do. So when we plant sparingly, and then we need, you know, a huge amount of mulch permanently underneath all of these plantings that have to be permanently maintained with mulch and pre-emergent herbicides, we're realizing, like, we're, we're, we're keeping plants in a perpetual establishment phase by keeping that much bare ground open forever, right? Because this is what plants naturally want to do. Plants fill space. And so a big part of our firm is really thinking about ecological horticulture. And a lot of our own work, when we get hard to do, is just doing kind of these biodiverse mixes, but for high visibility sites. It's, it's a, you know, for public parks. Uh, we're working like skyscrapers in Manhattan, uh, doing a lot of public garden work uh, in many different places. And then um, this is just a, a quick uh, moment of shameless self-promotion with the book. If you want to know more about that, we do have a book that's out there. And, and I do want to say that kind of these different approaches to planting design, they're not all ours. I really feel like this is part of a beginning of a shift that's been pioneered by different uh, practitioners all over the world, especially a lot in Europe. Uh, I see the work of Cassian Smit, uh, you know, Pete Aldolf, and the way he's changing the aesthetic around kind of uh, a more ecological aesthetic. Uh, brown is a color, too, and, you know, things like that. Uh, uh, 
people like Larry Weiner in North America, uh, all over the world, lots of different, this is a big tent movement. You know, what FIDO is doing, what we're, the way we approach this, is just one way of many. Uh, so I'm not trying to sell a style, I'm not, trying to, I'm not selling a mission necessarily. It, it, this is just a different way of thinking that what I really hope happens is that here in Florida, people start taking the, the pieces of this that are most relevant to you and start implementing this uh, in, in different ways. So the way we got our start in thinking about this, this is some of the work of my partner, Claudia West, when she was working at North Creek Nurseries. North, Claudia at the time was probably designing anywhere between 70 to 90 planting plans a year uh, as a salesperson for North Greeks, mostly of other failed landscape architectural projects. You know, a lot of green infrastructure that had totally failed, people put in a few plants, all scoured out, um, and then she had to come in there. And she had, North Creek had you know, uh, massive greenhouses filled with you know, several hundred species of uh, herbaceous perennials. And so Cloudy would just go in there and take the plants and hack, figure out what works to solve the problems in all these different urban areas. This is a bioswale at the, the uh, nursery. It was one of the trial gardens they did. The only maintenance this got was a three-bladed mower went over it once a year. Uh, but a lot of kind of the, 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 the thinking behind this is how can we get these biodiverse mixes to go in? How can we do it with as little maintenance as possible? How can we plant them as tightly together as possible so that there's no weed pressure? No, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. And then how can we get them to bloom as long as period as possible? And this is all 100% native species. Uh, but, but the acceptance of biodiversity mixes is really dominated by flower color. Having this rolling wave of color from you know, uh, early in the season to the latest season as possible. Because when you know, this is fine, but when it starts looking like this, you know, the, the acceptance of these in terms of the public is way, way high up. Way, way high up. And then the techniques of planting. You know, how can we change that? So a lot of, a lot of our work, we're using plug, landscape plugs, which are about six inches deep, uh, planting them 12 inches on center, very, very tightly. And I just want to explain, we're not planting big plants that, want to, that they get fungal diseases because they grow, get so tight together. We're planting the majority small ground covers, and the big plants are spaced four or five feet apart, very far apart. You know, so that the average spacing is more like 12 inches on center. But the thing that in, ends up happening by doing this planting type is that you can see in a period of a few weeks, there's no more bare soil. So almost mulchless systems. And, and the big reason for this is, as everyone was saying before, the, in terms of initial installation, the challenges of weed pressure is huge, of weed pressure so much. And there's so much chemical dependence. And we talk about native plantings, but if they're going to have to have truckloads of mulch brought in, uh, even pine straw, which is better than mulch, obviously, but truckloads of that every single year. I mean, think about the carbon cycle of that. And why are we doing that? Because we're excluding what plants naturally want to do, right? If, there, if a weed's coming up, there's a gap where a plant could have grown. That's the way we think about it. You know, there, that's, that's a missing gap. You're just keeping it open for, for something else. So you can see the types of plantings that we're using. These plugs, these enable us to plant very quickly. Uh, you're, we're spending all the money on the roots. You know, very, they starve the plants in the nursery. So they keep them very, very uh, tiny. Uh, but you get this kind of filling in in weeks uh, instead of waiting years and years. And then for us, that allows us to pick smaller woodies. You know, if we, wanna, if we have the whole little postage stamp in the front yard is looking, filling with color, and the trees or the little shrubs are small for the first few years, that's okay. You know, like it, it allows us to do smaller because by planting smaller, it's a more sustainable way of planting the woodies as well, and they'd be able to grow in. So um, less reliance, and, and this thing about the deep south, which is always a little weird to me, is like the amount of uh, woodies that are used. Um, you know, it's, it's a woody-dominated landscape palette. And I think it's not because it's necessarily better uh, here. I think it's just because of what people know. I mean, ornamental grasses were barely in the nursery 10 years ago, right? And now you see pink muli everywhere. It's not that pink muli was a bad selection for Florida landscapes. Just people just didn't know what to do. You know, the only things in the nursery trade were woodies. So I think really kind of shifting to a more herbaceous dominated uh, uh, approach, uh, many, many benefits for this as well. And then many times we also add seeds because uh, uh, a lot of our projects were interested in establishing populations. So if we have a mix of switchgrass or some grass that's in a mix, because that's probably a clone that was grown in the nursery, we want more genetic diversity, we'll seed the same thing over on top of that. So that's the other thing about building abund rebuilding abundance is we want to have the genetic diversity and we want the ability, you know, if, if, if a weed is going to germinate, we'd rather it be something we've selected. So as a part of our mixes, 
we're very often selecting 10 to 15% of our mixes are self-sowers, high degree of self-sowers, very dynamic species, because we want to create our own weeds, like the Coreopsis that Jimmy was showing in that way. You know, so if the Coreopsis reseeds, that's something that's part of the palette, not the end of the world, and, and something like that in a mix like that. So it's about kind of you know, increasing the, the chances that it's not a Eurasian weed bank, increasing the chances that uh, it's a native species that we want. And we're also trying to do different techniques to save money because we're doing this increased density approach. Uh, very often doing things like using drill augers, um, where a crew can install 300 or 400 plants an hour. Um, so that it, it, you know, it goes very, very quickly. In fact, very, very often we'll pre-auger a site, 12 to 15, and then just drop in the plants uh, very, very quickly. So it's so really about kind of developing techniques around the installation itself to minimize site maintenance, minimize kind of the disturbance of soils, uh, you know, when we are not having to, when, when it's a, we have decent soils, um, and, and to minimize, you know, if, again, the, you know, the more you rototill, the more you turn up, uh, as they were talking about in the last session, the more weeds pressure there is. This kind of drill augering is very uh, good about keeping the soil layers without having to kind of till and losing on the pore space. And you can see the flat, that's 50 plants on the flat. You know, so even just showing up, you think about if this were one gallon perennials, how, how much peat moss uh, in plastic, you know, it would be for 50 plants versus a tray of something like that. So again, just like as, as much as possible going smaller uh, so that we're reducing the footprint and we're buying more plants rather than more plastic and peat moss from Canada, right? So the reason I think we're trying to rethink some of these things is because we're surrounded by landscapes that are looking increasingly kind of urbanized. And, and the, the French landscape architect, Gilles Clement, has this, uh, wonderful phrase about the third landscapes being kind of all of this leftover areas in urban, suburban, and town development where nature still can be. These are areas we need more biodiversity. You know, these are areas that can't just be uh, maintained uh, with in, in the, the cheapest possible ways. These are areas that, that require different ways of thinking about it. So a lot of the techniques that we're very interested in doing is about thinking about these kind of landscapes. Uh, this is a, a, a bio, one of the bioretention since it was a failed one that Cloudy ended up replanting. There's probably uh, 35 species in this uh, planting mix. It doesn't always look that diverse. You know, again, we're trying to have, be, have a few visually dominant plants. Uh, this is a very grassy system. A big reason that the original planting failed is because the, the soil mix was almost 99% pure sand. So instead of, it, it was a rain garden, but instead of being really wet, drought was what was killing every drought and salt because this is in Pennsylvania, in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, was killing most of the things. So we ended up going with a, you know, very much a coastal palette that was very uh, tolerant of salt. Uh, but multiple species in there, and this has been in for six or seven years, almost no maintenance. Um, they offered us to do like 100 of these initially, and we said we want to do two really well with your maintenance team, uh, because there's a totally different way of doing these for, for these screws. But what was there before is just a few shrubs and mulch. Uh, in the middle of these plantings, and that was the bioretention. So, uh, but what's amazing about it is just a, there's a, a, a brewery right across the street just to see all the life buzzing on something like this. But you can't, there is no mulch, and there's no, these are not mulched at all. Now, we, we keep these very low. And the ones that are doing the best are the ones that are the leanest soils, you know, the, 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 the least fertility. The, mo the more fertile the soils, the quicker they grow, the more competition ends up happening, the more they start flopping, the more weed pressure there is. You know, those are the, by far the highest maintenance ones. The, there's a few of them that are super lean, and those are the ones that have the, the nicest look, more compact. Uh, a lot of our natives actually like that. Now, you're down here, you're dealing with a lot more sand. You know, in the, in the north, uh, in the mid-Atlantic, we have a lot more clay, much more nutrient-rich. So you might need to add more compost and a little more fertility because you're dealing, you know, the CEC of sand is much lower. But in our areas, like, you know, soil fertility is a real problem. So... I'm going to show you a bunch of images today and t tell you a little bit about our process and just to give you a set of tools that I think maybe you can use uh, that hopefully will be helpful. But a lot of the examples I want to show you really fall in this gradient. Sometimes the, the, these ideas are more appropriate for something like green infrastructure where the aesthetic goals are not that high. It's just about keeping the ground covered uh, and making we have as many plant roots in the soil as possible. Other times in more high visibility sites, the goal is to have something as blooming as long as possible. It's the same set of tools, the way we think about designing the scene, the same set of tools for no matter what your goal is, to keep the ground covered as much as possible or to get as much flower color as possible. But it's just, just understand there's different contexts. Sometimes I'm gonna show you images today that look a little kind of green and boring and sometimes they can be very visually exciting. 
uh, in terms of that. And it's just, it's just kind of depending on the context and what the goals are. So the way we think about kind of this new approach to planting, it's really about creating three relationships. I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. One is the right plant to place relationship. And I want to talk about that. You know, how do we translate the wild? How do you take a wild inspiration and bring it to a design landscape? Two, how do plants relate to people? You know, how do we make it like immersive and, and really uh, pleasing? And then three, how do we kind of layer plants so they actually are interacting in a way that is stable and not creating more problems for us? So number one, plants to place. How do we translate the beauty of the wild for our urban and suburban landscapes? And, and I think this is really important to do. This is kind of getting back to this idea of fantasy as being the driver for many of our landscapes. I think it's important to have a fantasy about this because I think we all react to certain landscapes in a very intuitive way. Certain wild landscapes are appealing across cultures, and certain ones are also often very threatening. You know, there's something about being in certain wild, whether it's a forest or something, that are emotional and very appealing to us. We can look at, you know, this is like screensaver images, right, or, or calendar vegetation that we put up on our, on our thing and just gives us a sense of peace. Whereas there are other kind of configurations of land that are inherently uncomfortable. And I think a lot of this is kind of our evolution to certain spaces that, you know, that we didn't have visibility through or are inherently unappealing to us because it was a safety concern. There's things we can see very far and long, we like a lot, uh, one way or the other. So one of the big challenges, I think, when thinking about kind of translating the wild is the problem of scale. When we see natural vegetation in the wild, we're seeing it at huge scale. Waterfalls in the backgrounds, clouds, but butterflies, uh, rainbows. And then thinking about taking any moment of these landscapes on the left and dropping them there, all of a sudden, like, you know, does it really even feel like that anymore? So how do we kind of get over this kind of scale issue one way or the other? And so I think this is really important. If you're talking about native landscapes in design settings, sometimes this is an image I took not too long ago uh, in the mid-Atlantic of an undervegetated native plant garden. High aspirations of, of having a design that evoked the wild, that felt like something natural. But I mean, is there anything emotional about this to you? I mean, if you look at this, do you feel like in super inspired? You know, like I, I really don't. Now here's one that's a little more vegetated, but again, you know, it's a wild native garden. Is it super inspiring? Not necessarily. I was at uh, Mount Cuba Center. This is a design landscape, and I was just, I took this image in this moment. It was very emotional to me. And, you know, you can see the, the self-sowing of the flacia. You can see the sedges. You can see kind of this woodland edge community. But it just, it just felt like a moment. And I started thinking about this is not that different in scale from a lot of backyards. Uh, in, in many ways, right, one way or the other. So what is it about certain places that are emotional to us, that are accessible emotionally, and other kind of plantings that are just, they're fine to look at, but not necessarily emotional. Uh, so what I'm really fascinated in is designs, especially small designs that evoke, that transport you to a larger moment in nature. You know, that's how we take the problem of, of scale. This is a design done by Chelsea Flower Show uh, by Sarah Price. Uh, in the London show garden. The thing I loved about it is just how it felt like a, a floodplain community. You know, she took all of the patterns of a floodplain community, and the whole thing's not much bigger than this area I'm walking in here. That's the whole garden, super tiny. But these little evocative moments felt like a much bigger moment, felt emotional, felt... Uh, and, and again, this is part of this fantasy. See, because I think if we want to sell native plants, we have to sell these immersive fantasies as well. We can't say all fantasies are bad. We just need to replace the Brazilian one with a more native one. But we need to pick a really good native one. You know, that's the point. Like, we need to pack really good native inspirations. You know, it's not that the plant world has been created according to man's taste, but that the taste of mankind has gradually molded itself to the plant world. You know, so there's certain natural landscapes, and, the, and some of the ones I showed of Florida as well, I think they're inherently appealing, and certain ones that are less so appealing. So what can we do about this? Part of what, and we talk about this in our book, part of why we're talking about kind of archetypal landscapes is because these are the landscapes that we find all over the, the kind of temperate world that really are emotionally accessible. These are the, the kind of the, the ones, the, the examples, and, and there are forests, and we have kind of three major categories here, forests, savanna, woodland savanna, shrublands, and grassland. You know, and basically this is just a gradient of canopy coverage, you know, from, from trees touching to almost no trees at all, right? This is essentially a gradient of that. But there are certain versions of each of these that are inherently very uh, appealing and pleasing and certain versions that are not. Um, so again, you can see kind of this, this kind of gradient here of canopy coverage from forest uh, 
to woodlands where the trees are not quite touching, to the savannas where you get a few, uh, like your, your pine savannas down here. Uh, Longleaf pine communities would kind of fall in these middle two categories, down to grassland or meadows. When we do a design, we're very specific to say that our designs or our plantings fit one of these categories. And a lot of what we feel like is a problem in so much native plant design is that there's a mishmash of all of this. No one really thinks like there's a little bit of forest here, there's a little bit of this. But for us, it's important that the, the core patterns fit very distinctly one of these things. Because if, if you fit the patterns uh, well, it feels uh, really wonderful. So for example, just to give you things, here's a, a grassland archetype, ar archetype from Central Florida. And, and those, you know, there's many variations of these from super dry ones to super wet ones. So, I, I, you know, I'm, we're, I'm intentionally oversimplifying, you know, all of the natural world into three basic categories. Uh, so, but just to, just to say, like, I, I know it's a, it's a gross over, oversimplification. But here is a meadow garden, you know, a garden that takes that, the, that grassland archetype and there's no shrubs in it. You know, if we start dropping shrubs in it or lots of trees in it, it would start losing, I think, the appeal of, of that, right? So we start mixing the archetypes in a small space. You can lose the power that a small planting can have. Or here's a meadow uh, garden designed by Adam Woodruff around a, a suburban, an Illinois suburban pool. Uh, but the thing I think is very powerful about this emotionally is that it really uh, evokes a feeling of a grassland. And again, if he had three understory trees in it and a row of hedges and start dropping a bunch of butterfly bushes and stuff in the middle of that, all of a sudden it would feel differently, right? So the purity of the archetype in this, I think, it, it, it enhances the evocative power of a small space, right? Or even these grassland-inspired, these Lancaster ones we did, we're, we're all said these are all going to be like grassland, you know, and they're like, well, can we put some shrubs? Can we put some, you know, different things in them? And we're like, no, let's just, you know, it doesn't add a whole lot to do that. Like, we think it needs to be cleaner, these will stamp all the way up, and this is going to be a grass. We had other ones in, in shadier areas that had trees, but for this area, we really want to kind of keep the archetypes pure so that they can have more power. Now, this was a, a residential garden in Philadelphia we're working on, and this is a good example, I think, of something that's a confused archetype. Um, you can look at an image here. There's this wonderful kind of uh, creek flowing through the middle of the property, and the previous owner or the owner there started kind of planting understory trees in that, which, which is totally fine, but it's really hard to tell. It's kind of grassland. It's kind of edge. You don't really know. But the, the most pleasing part, if you can look up here, there's a grove of walnuts there. This is archetypally pure, right? That was a really amazing spot, whereas here, this was kind of a confusing archetype in one, one way or the other. So one of our long-term goals is basically to pull the power of this all the way through here and create this as more of a bottomland forest. So we're getting rid of a lot of the grassland ideas and we're starting to plant lots of trees in this and really want, and, and starting to have a, a management strategy so this would, uh, and, and we're also unchannelizing this little creek uh, so it floods a little bit more. So it really starts working more like a floodplain forest and we're really expanding on the archetype that emotionally, everyone loves that moment, everyone didn't love like, the moment quite as much. So part of kind of the power of this is understanding that this is kind of a messed up archetype, right? Like it doesn't really know what it's trying to be. It's landscaped, but it's not really evoking anything that really is appealing to any of us in one way or the other. So here's a meadow archetype that, you know, doesn't really do it for me. It's a little too tall. You know, so, so what is it about meadow archetypes? When they get too tall, we can't see through them anymore. And all the, the beauty of a grassland, the archetypal versions of a grassland archetype is that you can see over them. It's the visibility through them, right? So if we start doing kind of meadow plantings that are six, seven feet tall in small spaces, it's not going to feel good, you know, right? So, so we need to understand, like, it's not that this is a bad idea, it's just that it's too high, and it doesn't kind of, like, uh, correlate with the archetypes. Versus, like, the woodland savanna archetypes, so these are grassland examples. Here's a woodland savanna archetype examples. The thing I love about this, and the longleaf pine forest is a wonderful example of this, the patterning that happens in these woodland savanna archetypes. You know, where you get these little uh, colonies of rhizomatous, I uh, think about the Saranoa uh, repens in the middle of the wiregrass or something like that. You just get these patterns that are just so wonderful. I think this is an underutilized archetype for suburban landscapes because these are very park-like. You know, you've got a handful of trees, you've got some shrubs in different ways, you've got a lot, a lot of herbaceous species as well. But I love the patterns of this. The thing I like, we like about the savannas is the visibility at eye level, right? I mean, you can see something coming from very far away, long views, is not cluttered at all. Um, so you, you kind of have this, this wonderful thing. So uh, this is a coastal plain example. This is one of your examples from down here in Florida. Uh, but again, that kind of patterning like the cinnamon fern uh, running in colonies in the middle of uh, the wiregrass and everything else. 
So this is a very layered um, uh, one, and one in which uh, woodies can coexist with herbaceous species. So you can almost imagine a massed landscape you know, uh, in a different area with the little massings of uh, low shrubs, ferns, and herbaceous species creating similar patterns in a residential landscape. So very st strongly patterned, uh, lots of uh, rhizomatous and clonal spreading plants. And then the forest archetype, and I think that there's many versions of forests, but the ones that are the most archetypally appealing to people are, are something like this. High visibility, sparkling ground plane, simplicity in the tree layer. Not that th there's only one species, but it's just kind of this clarity of layers that's really appealing to people. This is why this is calendar vegetation. Or this is a very appealing forest space, right? This is just the clarity of this, it's the, 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 the birches and the, the carrots underneath that. Uh, whereas once you start getting some of these edge conditions, there's particularly like invaded or with vines starting coming in, the layers get blurred. It's a very, I mean, this is very different emotionally than this, right? I mean, like there's just something, you can feel it when you just show the images. And I think we're trying to pay attention to clues. If we're gonna do a forest planting for our clients, you know, we need to make sure there's, there's maybe very few shrubs in it, or we put the shrubs only on the edge of the property, right? So we keep it kind of clean and pure and something like this. So it's not just native plantings, can we make the patterns of the native plantings really kind of connect with spaces that people really feel uh, connected with? Uh, right now we're working at Toronto Botanic Garden and their central core gardens. It was a mess in the middle. And, and so they had this kind of like maze, which is fun. They had this, all this planting, but like what archetype is that? And so a big part of what we're doing is doing this new four acre gardens, all gonna be a savanna garden. All, it's gonna be nothing but canopy trees. You can't even see, there's all these buildings around that go there. Is we're gonna have nothing but trees and then uh, a wonderful herbaceous displays. And so we're kind of using a savanna archetype to kind of re-clarify the spaces and connect this, have a central campus area, get rid of the clutter that's there now and make it very strong. So, you know, a wonderful, this is a garden. This is a forest garden that I think very, uh, does an excellent job, this New York Botanic Garden. The shrub layers push back and it takes the patterns of the archetype and makes it appealing for humans, right? So for wild plant, it's not just the pattern. So th that's the first kind of part of translating the wilds, like understanding like what, what are we trying to evoke? Like what is the fantasy? Is it forest? Is it shrubland? Is it that? And can we be consistent with that? But then what plants are we going to use? What plants from the wild can we actually bring into our gardens? And, and one of the things, the messages I want to have about this is it takes a lot of translation to take plants from the wild and bring them into our own landscapes. Very easy to look at something like this, you know, the wonderful so inspiring, I mean, this, this totally gets me off. <laughs> uh, but like the wiregrass, for example, and something, I'll just skip to this, wiregrass without fire is not a great landscape plant, right? As much as I would love to you know, recreate that landscape for a park, the wiregrass may not be the one we can do. So we have to substitute something because it really needs fire dependence. So, so much of the challenge of taking wild natives and bringing them into our own landscapes is understanding that many of the native species are daphic specialists, which means that they want something really wonky. They, they only exist there because of extreme soil pH or because of special uh, uh, soil conditions or aged fungal soil in some cases. You know, they, they need the mycorrhizal community to even show up. Um, or super low pro productivity soils or special climate. You know, a lot of these things that we see, or fire, a certain type of disturbance, especially down here, right? So if you bring those into to landscapes that don't have those, they're not gonna survive. So what we have to do, and especially like the wiregrass is a great example of that. You know, like that is the dominant, like million years ago, the coastal plain was dominated with wiregrass from Texas all the way to Florida, right? I mean, that grass was everywhere. Now that we don't have fire, that can't be the grass that's everywhere, right? Not that we couldn't use it in some places, but it's really understanding if we want to have that look, we have to substitute the palette. We can still have that look, but maybe we need to use a different grass. So if we're trying to deal with the kind of landscapes that we've been talking about this weekend, you know, we really have to understand what natives from the wild are best, uh, are these kind of assertive generalists, right? They, they're not always specialists. They can deal with variable soil pH. I thought the presentation yesterday sh showing where one plot was 8.0 and one plot was five, you know, like w there are plants that love the eight and there are the plants that love the five, but they're not the same, right? So like what are the ones that can handle the variation of young soils with very little microbiology, even hydrology, high compaction. And the type of testing that they're doing here is the exact, I mean, it, it's brilliant. It's exactly what you, we all need to do more in landscapes. He's trialing these things. The other thing I'll say is we need more of our wild plants in cultivation. We don't have enough. What's in cultivation now is a, it's a pathetic fraction of the diversity of the wild. 
Not all those wild plants are going to make it into cultivation. Not all of them can live in a pot for a little while. Not all of them can do that. But we need more. So the more this group of people can encourage people to go out in the wild and start selecting for the next ones, and maybe it's a species that already exists, it's just a different cultivar, you know, a better cultivar, something shorter or whatever. You know, like we need more diversity in our, because most of the times we're planting clones uh, of the same native species over and over again, right? So it's a push to get more diversity into, into cultivation, and this is, is this, this kind of a group that can do this. But an understanding that we can't just go to the wild and just pull it directly in. We have to translate the palate in one way or the other to, in order to do that. But here's, here's a great example. I, this, um, just to give credit, uh, this is myfloridameadow.com. Uh, I've uh, seen some of these and doing some research for this talk. These are non-fire dependent meadows that are being designed. For, for meadows, you know, the, not using the wire grass, not using a lot of the fire dependent species. They created a beautiful Florida meadow, more out of aggressive generalists that can handle kind of these, these different kind of conditions. So it can be done. It's this translation process, though, that really makes it important to do something like that. So in translating a wild palette, when to move away just from the specialist to, to more adaptive generalist, uh, uh, ones that can take different types of soil um, and that don't require very specific stresses in one way or the other. Uh, and then the last little point in this is like, I think to make a wild planting or a design planting feel like a moment of nature and kind of have that fantasy that we're trying to do, using a dominant species I think is often very important in something like this. In almost every plant community, even the most biodiverse ones, there's often dominant plants in them. So when we see a little bit of grass, right, it reminds us of something like this. When we see a big leaf plant, it is evocative of something like a floodplain community, right? So if we want the feeling of this space, you know, we wouldn't do a fine textured grass. We, we would do, in, for that example, the confused archetype I showed you where we're doing a, a floodplain, we're doing a lot of the skunk cabbage in there because we want broadleaf textures to really amplify the feeling of that archetype, what a floodplain forest would feel like and using very few fine textured plants. So that's one of the filters for the plant palette for us, you know, because we want to kind of evoke this feeling. Or this combination in this design garden, I mean, just look at this one, and then this is wild, right? But this is why I think this designer who's so good like every selection, which is a totally different species, not even anything near the same species, but it's the same feeling of a floodplain community. It gives you that, I mean, and this is what I love. And this is the pleasure, I think, of, this can be the pleasure of native plantings in urban areas. The High Line right now is the most visited site in all of New York City. What does it say that people in, in concrete jungle of New York City want to go see a phony simulation of a meadow than anything else in New York City? They want to have moments that transport them. They want to see a butterfly. They want to be, they want to, have the spiritual connection of seeing a moment that feels like something more than bedding plants, for crying out loud, right? It's to have moments of this. So understanding the artistry of kind of how we can connect people to these moments in the wild in urban places is going to be part of the new fantasy of the future, right? It's not about kind of another Brazilian version of this. So understanding, like, what is it about the wild plant communities, their patterns, their forms, their elements that can be amplified and brought in? And what is it about the dry shade here, the colonial of the, the May apple spreading here that's so appealing? You know, that is a perfect inspiration for this design setting, you know, where, where we're going to plant May apples in a clone, in, in, in a massing, because that's the way they grow in the wild, right? We're not going to dot these in the landscape like we've dotted some of the ferns and other stuff in this garden, the New York Botanic Garden. We've, we've put them in, in a big massing to, to simulate the patterns of how they grow in the wild, right? Because that feels more evocative if we did that with that species. Or what is it about this grove that's so powerful uh, and, and feels kind of sacred that works in this tiny, this, this New York Times headquarter building designed by H.M. White. In the middle, they have this courtyard. What I love about it is just the simplicity of the archetype here. You know, they've just taken a little bit of mounding, the birch trees, and some sedges, and it, it really feels like, you know, that kind of connection. And I would even, I would even argue that they could go in and plant even seven or eight other species on the ground plane, as long as it's low, and it wouldn't really cha challenge the archetype. But using enough of the dominant species, the birches and the sedges in this, that it has, is evocative. You know, this little thing, this, it's like a terrarium, really, in this building, uh, but gives you the moment of feeling like uh, high elevation in the Appalachians, uh, where you see this birch. So inspired by the wild, but a translated plant palette is what's really important to do, so that we're really understanding the new conditions we're bringing these plants into on in one place or another. Uh, right now, we're working on this really exciting project. This is in uh, Toronto. Uh, right now, the, the site is currently a parking lot. It's going to be a park. Behind the park, you can see this elevated highway, really loud and noisy, lots of salt coming off that. It's a very sexy site. Um, very unpleasant 
uh, noise. Uh, but w one of the reasons uh, us and uh, why architecture won the competition for this is that we had this idea that this is the site there, but just up the lake uh, are these wonderful cliffs. If we can bring the cliffs to that park, uh, this is what they look like here, and create kind of a faux cliff that screens out that elevated highway. And then we can cover this with uh, uh, vegetation inspired by the vegetation that we found here on the lake edge, you know, to really give people an immersive experience of this park. Uh, and so you can kind of see the, the basic strategy here, kind of creating a screen, folding the surface, and then covering it with plants. Uh, and this is the vision that's under design right now. Uh, but it has all kinds of rock climbing walls and um, uh, restaurants and all kinds of stuff on this faux cliff. It's going to be really fun. So this is our inspiration, right? So we know what we want to be inspired by, very specific. We know the plants. Can we take these plants and put them in that urban area? No, we can't. We, some of them will work, but a lot of them won't. So we have to translate the palette in a similar pattern. So a big part of what we're doing is we're trying to kind of understand what are the general zones that happen along these cliffs, this dry upland area, these dynamic open um, uh, kind of talus slopes, uh, and, and the much more kind of broad textures you get in the, as it gets wetter, uh, even down in the, the ravines. And then we're kind of simplifying kind of these zones uh, and making sure that we understand kind of a character image for each one of these, understanding the visual essence of each of those zones and what makes what makes the high elevation with the fine textures and the gnarled uh, trees growing out of rocks feel like an like a edge versus when you get to this uh, rich ravine, broad textures, sparkling vegetation at the bottom. Uh, what makes it feel like you're walking through a, you know, with the creeks going in between the thing? Very different feeling here. <laughs> Sorry. Very different feeling here than the feeling up top. Um, but a very translated palette. So we're, we'll, we'll have to use what's nursery available. Uh, again, but we're using these filters of the wild in order to kind of recreate the places. And then also thinking about maintenance strategies to make sure that these things can be maintained. So just a, an example to show you a, a project where we're using a wild inspiration, but having to translate that inspiration specifically for that site. And this is kind of the, the vision of a very immersive park. Uh, again, we're kind of early concepts in this. So that was all about kind of, that's my, my big one. I have two other little uh, smaller points here. How do we create create spaces for people. And one of the things that uh, occurs to me as I look around the American suburban landscape is a big problem of why plantings fail to inspire is because we don't have enough plants. So conventional approaches to planting design, uh, and this is a, a very distinguished uh, landscape architect who designed this, but they very often treat plants as objects, right? As, as roads, as hedges, as things that happen in a space, uh, one way or the other. And this is true, this, these are all award winners from uh, landscape architecture. Um, they won for all different kind of ways, but you get this kind of plants as objects, plants as stripes, plants as carpets, uh, in one way or the other. Immersive plantings, to me, feel differently. You know, this feels immersive, right, where you're kind of walking through a path through plants. This feels like a garden space, right, to, to get to a certain place. Or, or you're in the middle, it's almost like someone just cleared a meadow to get it into a space so you can sit in the middle of plantings. And this changes the way that plantings feel. And a part of why I'm, I'm bringing this up is because I think if we have enough plantings and we use them in the right spatial patterns, we can increase the acceptance of more native plantings around people. So it's not just about, because if all we do is take the tr traditional suburban patterns of foundation planting and lawn, and we replace one for one the Laura Petalum with the Viburnum, you know, we're not really changing the equation one way or the other. You know, I think the thing that's so wonderful about uh, Dix Carter's uh, plant plans uh, that they presented today is they're really changing the patterns uh, in one way or the other. It's super exciting. So when we design our planting plants, we, uh, our first process, is we, we think about our, uh, what we call this black and white method. And I just want to share this really quickly. So the big idea is that the best garden spaces, the most immersive plantings, are surrounded by plants on all sides. So if you're in a terrace, you got plants around you on all sides. If you're on a path, there are plants around you on all sides, right? So Planting is the default. When we think about our blank sheet of paper, we immediately cover it in all plants. We imagine a meadow at about uh, knee height covering the entire garden. And then as we go thinking about where we want the lawns, where we want the paths, we think about going in there with, a, with like Jimmy's lawnmower and carving into it, you know, with a machete or a lawnmower or something. Uh, and that's how we do design. It's, it's really basically very simple. So the black and white method is this. We, we, we cover our sheet in black, which is plants. Like, it just mentally the default. Instead of lawn being the default, the default is all plants in a, in a project. And then white is anything you can walk on. A terrace, a lawn, a, a gravel path, a mulch path. It doesn't really matter. We don't, we don't specify what that is. 
So mentally, we take our sheets of paper and everything's black, and then we just start carving through, almost designed by subtraction, what would be in there. So uh, here's an example you see here. Um, this was, um, oh, this, uh, this got flattened in this uh, uh, conversion. But uh, this is a row house. Uh, so we initially would think about something being 100% uh, uh, black, all planting. We drop a terrace in. We, we carve our pass through. Oh, it's not going to come through. I had this layered in here. But anyways, you'll see, you can see what happens. Basically, this becomes pass and it becomes terrace, and everything else becomes planting. In, in, in a space like that. So this really becomes designed by subtraction one way or the other. Almost like something like you see here. So it doesn't, it doesn't mean we can't have turf. The thing is, as the best turfs to me are surrounded by all sides by planting, though. So if we want to have a decent sized turf, we just make sure it uh, has planting around it one way or the other. So the white space tends to float in the middle. So very often, like in suburban, if they have a little terrace, they'll be shoved up against the house, which doesn't always feel good. So in our designs, very often we're kind of pulling the, the the terrace just a few feet off into the planting bed itself so that you walk a few feet to get into uh, a terrace or something and, and something like that. So making the paths feel carved out of thick planting. And I thought the, the test gardens, uh, the ones that um, were designed that you walked through today, that was perfect black and white. Like everything was planting and they just carved those little curved paths through. Love that. Very immersive the way they did this pass through there. This is a project uh, designed by another landscape architect in New York, kind of with the same idea, all plantings and just like this little boardwalk cutting right through it. And it feels very immersive. You know, that is not that much planting. That is not a super deep bed. But because you're walking through the planting, you have this immersive experience uh, that makes it really wonderful. The reason I like this and the reason I'm talking about this kind of black and white method is a method that allows more biodiversity in planting. It is a method by which people are more accepted. They like this because this is more accepted. Being on a boardwalk, going through a lot of plantings, it makes you feel like it's okay to have a lot of biodiverse plantings, which is very different than a lot of conventional suburban front yards. So it's changing the method. I think what, what's working so well at Sunbridge in a lot of these kind of houses is that they change the, the pattern so there's not as much lawn that's dependent in some of that. This really uh, makes it. Here's a streetscape designed by Scape, and they almost have the same, you can see it in plan view, like, Imagine this is all planting, and then they just carve through. So you get these kind of wonderful connected beds along the street edge, which really separate you. But even in a streetscape environment, that feels more immersive than if this just had been a bunch of lollipop trees down with planting only on that side, right? So very simple black and white method. Kind of start with white, cover everything in two to three feet tall of planting, locate the spaces that you want, your favorite spaces, and then carve paths to connect it. And, and the, the kind of the design language, the geometry, it doesn't really matter. You can do something very rectilinear, you can do something curvilinear, you know, that depends on the site or the architecture. But this is a method that guarantees there's enough planting in every site around where it is that you can get away with more biodiverse native planting in it, one way or the other. So that's relating plants to people. The last one I want to talk about is kind of relating plants to plants. And this really has to do with layering plants like a lasagna cake. The principle of getting as many roots in the soil as possible is really important. The thing that's really amazing about a lot of uh, herbaceous systems is how layered they are. Not only, they actually have, like uh, meadows, very often have canopy species within the herbaceous layer, right? Certain species are like canopies. You have a ground cover layer here, and, and then the root systems parallel the, the morphological diversity of the top. So here you have, you know, certain forbs that, have, that are taprooted, whereas a lot of these grasses, you can see going down here, go down, uh, 8, 10, 12 feet. A lot of herbaceous systems, the root systems are deeper than trees. A lot of people think trees are the deeper rooted ones, but with herbaceous plantings very often, it's, it's the better species that are much deeper rooted than trees. In herbaceous plants, very often the roots of these plants are deciduous. So people ask, well, what about, don't we need mulch to add uh, carbon, you know, to add nutrients to the soils? No, these roots die back in the winter and they regrow. So I mean, this is why the prairies have some of the best topsoils in, in the world. It's because of the way these roots are deciduous in, in the, in the wintertime. You're building carbon through, the, through root storage. Uh, very amazing carbon storage techniques. So, and, and the other thing is you don't have soil microbiology without roots. You can put as much mycorrhizal stimulus as you want. It is the sugars on the tips of the roots that attract the fungus and the bacteria that they're there. So when you have a few shrubs in the middle of a mulch bed, there's not enough roots in that ground to attract enough life in that soil. The more diversity of roots you have in the soil, even if it's weeds, you'll have more microbial life. All of the benefits of, of that happens in soil with roots happen from as having many different types of roots in the soil as possible. So that's the principle, the big principle. So we can get more roots in the ground of, of diversity types, 
the better it's going to be for stormwater uptake, for carbon storage, for, for everything that you want, for soil microbiology, for, um, uh, for everything. So, you know, in the future, this is a gradient of these kind of mixed plantings. And, and one thing that I just want to point out is sometimes we do mixed plantings that are very stylized, which is really more like horticulture with a kind of an ecological aesthetic, a lot more maintenance and something like that. And then other times we're doing strategies where it's really about using a lot of aggressive competitive species uh, and, and we're creating uh, you know, self-sustaining populations. We're using self-sowers, we're using aggressive, and, and there are plenty, of like there's some green infrastructure where that's totally appropriate. Like you know, a suburban green infrastructure where there's very little visibility of it, where you need that kind of aggressiveness of certain native species in order to do that. So you know, in the future we need all three of these types, but I just want to talk about, I'm going to talk about mixed plantings. Just understand there are times you can use it for kind of high design style, which we do for some of our projects, and sometimes we're using it more for kind of population dynamics. So you can imagine like the back of a parking lot, this would be more important, whereas, you know, a, a garden space, that would be more important. Uh, in our book, we talk about kind of understanding plants in terms of their, what a rabbit sees, the morphology of a plant. And that means something like a pink muley grass is not a ground cover. Right? Everybody will call every, or, every herbaceous species a ground cover, but something like a pink muley grass or like a lot of the stuff that's in this, these herbaceous plants in these landscapes are more like a structural plant. They're more upright plant. And in the wild, they grow with all kinds of other things, uh, with the, whether these, these seasonal themes or these ground covers underneath them in many different layers. Uh, and you can see the kind of morphological diversity. If you go in the wild, this is just an experiment. Go home if you don't have a perfectly maintained uh, yard. Look at the weeds in your lawn. Very often the weeds in your turf grass are a different morphology shape than what grows there. If you have clover growing in your lawn, you know, it's very often a different, it's growing horizontally through the upright blades of a zoysia or something like that. You know, it, it is because plants fill niches. If there's an open niche that's created through monoculture, whether it's shrubs or native plants or anything else, a plant's going to fill that niche down here. If we leave it open, without, or, or unless we keep pouring mulch and pre-emergent herbicides on it, plants will fill space. And so our principle is, can we think about a desirable plant that we want in that layer, rather than just letting weeds or, or invasive species or whatever take over that? So the way we do that is just thinking about plant shapes and thinking about something like an echinacea or a coneflower or a pink muley grass as an upper layer design species that gets in there, and then thinking about a whole range of plants uh, like sedges and other species we can fill in underneath to uh, become that ground cover layer underneath. I thought Jenny was talking uh, earlier in the last session talking about like letting the mimosa grow and you can plant through it. That's exactly the kind of principles that we're trying to do in all of our plantings, having a ground cover kind of underneath uh, a taller or more upright plant, even if the other plant is technically a ground cover, you know, or like a, a, a sedge or something like that. So how do, can we tell what plants are what? If it has an upright form with naked bare legs, you know, uh, that is very often an upper layer design layer, whereas if it's more like a sedge or a horizontally spreading plant, that's more like a ground cover. And so we're looking for combinations like this because once you have combinations like this, there's very little maintenance whatsoever. This is incredibly stable planting that will last for years and years and years. N you can't squeeze a piece of mulch in there. You can't put a piece of bark mulch in there. You know, there's very little that needs to be done in something like this. And this is a cool season grower, so it's active in the winter. This is a warm season grower. So very often we're thinking about complementary relationships so that when there's a gap, when this is in early spring when this hasn't emerged yet, this is covering the ground. So there's no sunlight hitting that soil, letting all the carbon go up and all, killing all the mic uh, microbes every time sunlight hits the, the top of the soil. So thinking about planting is like, you know, like a trifle, right? Like, like these layer cakes. Now in plan view, very often this looks a little different than the traditional plant massing blobs uh, that are uh, often uh, shown. And it's not that we do, we're not anti-massing, there's uh, totally times to do massing. Uh, but the problem with, like, if you have 30 Emsoni hubrechtii here, that is an upright plant that will always have weeds underneath it. If, if, if you only put, you know, that plant in 30 there. And so you're always going to have to have mulch underneath that. So what we would do is we would take some of these upper layer plants and dot them throughout and then put ground covers, which you, you see in all these hatches underneath. So there's still design, there's still pattern making. You can see like the seasonal themes are drifted. We were kind of keeping things together, but instead of squeezing them so tight and putting mulch underneath them, we'll spread a drift apart and then put ground covers and other plants underneath them. And that way when these X's or these triangles are not blooming, there's something else, especially very often these ground covers are spring blooming plants. We get more, and again, this is great for pollinators as well, you get a spring layer. 
this happening, these ground covers are up first with the bulbs, and then we have summer layers coming later. So it's about this having this rolling buffet for pollinators uh, that also fills the gaps. So we're very often creating a design layer, the design layer putting on top of a natural system. You know, think about that. So, and sometimes our ground cover layers tend to be, you know, if we pick a, a grass matrix or a sedge matrix, or maybe we'll pick, uh, you know, a, a warm season grass with a, a sedge underneath it. So we have a warm season, cool season. That's the base. And then we'll pick three species that, to complement that, or we'll pick 12 species to complement that, depending on the complexity, right? So that's the other toggle you have as a designer is thinking about these mixes, is they can be really visually simple, you know, it kind of looks very monocultural, or it can be very visually exciting depending on how much of the design layer you put on top of the natural system, if that makes sense. So we're building ground covers with plants like spring blooming uh, ground covers. Uh, this is syringium, which grows, I think, really well here in the sand, uh, like the native ruelias, uh, a lot of the pacaros, the ground soles, uh, some of the flea banes. These tend to be very short species uh, that bloom in the springtime, and then when they stop blooming, the, they, they cut down and they just have a little basal foliage underneath them. And then on top of that, we're thinking about like our grasses or our grass-like plants. Sometimes we're doing these uh, more in kind of big monocultures some, or like a big matrix. Sometimes we're, we're dotting these accents in different places depending on the grass and how they natively grow. So building ground cover. So it, I, as I drive around Florida, you see bazillions of Muhlenbergia fields, right? So what if you want to do Muhlenbergia massing? Great, but why can't we put some maybe salvia purple knockout, which blooms in the spring, kind of at a low percentages underneath, spreading underneath that? Or maybe uh, we want to have something that pops out of it later in the summer, like the sylphium that comes up a little bit later, or a helianthus or something else. And you can make this as com visually complex or not as you want. You know, the, the purple knockout, you won't even see it as it, you know, see it in the springtime, but then the Muhlenbergia comes up, you won't even see it anymore, so it's not there. Uh, and if you want to have, you know, more plants popping up through it, that's great. But, you know, walking, I walked uh, my way here from the Wave Hotel today. The landscape uh, in front of the, um, the hospital center, almost all native species, but it was Muhlenbergian palms, and that's about it. So for an insect invertebrate, that's a purely native landscape that's green concrete, you know? And so the whole time I'm walking through this thinking, like, couldn't there be just a few more forbs in something like this? You know, why can't we have just a little bit more of some of these things in some of these plantings? So we're talking about native landscapes, but understanding, and I love the presentation yesterday, not all native plants are they're equal. Seeing that Eryngium yuccifolium, that rattlesnake master, that's a, that's a native super plant for pollinators. There are native super plants in every, every one. We need to be using more of these native super plants. That whole landscape I walked through could have had dozens, hundreds of Eryngium yuccifolium dotted in, and would, you'd barely be able to tell. It would still look like a pink mooly savanna, you know? But then they would have embedded all this extra biodiversity in something like that. So as we're thinking about native plants, we need to think, be thinking about the pollinators and kind of these four rich communities as well, not just that, that. Part of the reason we're thinking about these kind of layered systems is because we want competitive exclusion to increase the stability of the plantings. This is a sprobilus meadow. I just took this image kind of showing, uh, this is a native uh, strawberry uh, growing underneath that. This is not a very exciting plant, this native strawberry. It has a little tiny bloom. No one really cares about it, but the thing it does in that planting is that it prevents somebody from having to pull a weed regularly. And especially the sprobilus, it comes up almost in June in the mid-Atlantic. You know, it really doesn't inhabit space for a very long time. So this is actively growing in there so people don't have to, you know, put a pre-emergent herbicide, uh, uh, truckloads of mulch or something else in there, looking at competitive exclusion. So here's a good example of a traditional kind of monocultural amassing. This is a grass cisleria. A design plant community approach might look more like something like this. You know, we're embedding more forbs into something like this. Now, this might be too visually busy for you. So maybe we are only doing, instead of doing 12 species dropped in on top of that matrix, maybe you only do two. You know, maybe it's, uh, you know, a salve, and maybe you're only not doing ones that really stick up above. So as, as designers were thinking about this, you know, if you like kind of the simplicity of this, we can think about the right plants in there that still get more biodiversity in there that don't challenge the kind of cleanness of that, if that's an issue. Or we can make it very horticulturally exciting by having a lot more layers in it. It's all up to you about kind of how complex or not, depending on the context or the site. But it's just the idea that we don't just have to do this with mulch underneath it. We can have more in something like that. So these upper design layers, uh, just a, a few things. Very often we're designing some of these mixes where everything's the same height. If you do everything in a mix that's the exact same height, uh, 
uh, there's less competition for light. So we're really making sure uh, that things are growing all the time, same time of year. Um, there, sometimes we design these uh, systems, especially when we're getting to like taller prairie plants, where there's two layers in them. There's kind of an upper layer and a lower layer. Um, the thing that happens in that is you make, have to make sure your lower layer is shade tolerant. Because even in the spring, before these upper layer plants come up, uh, they'll be eventually kind of covered over by the other, other plants in there. So very often thinking about kind of what kind of system makes the most sense in different areas. So here's a single layer system, everything about the same height, uh, everything getting kind of equal levels of sunlight. Uh, these are very popular in like, uh, you know, high visibility settings. We're doing a lot of these very short plants, 12, 15 inches tall, uh, kind of keeping everything really low, very pleasant uh, and something like that versus kind of a, uh, something that requires an overstory where you're getting kind of emergence coming through. And so in this example, we're looking for you know, more uh, examples of perennials that can come through with naked upper stems, so you can see through them, uh, have more of emergent forms uh, coming through in that upper layer. So with this layering system for the tallest species, very often we're looking for emergent forms in our herbaceous plants. And what I mean by that is they have new leaves at the top. Because if you have a low mix and the, the tallest stuff is totally see-through, it increases the acceptance of that. You know, if, if you have a mix that has a lot of internal topography, people get wary of that. So the more it looks like a carpet, the better it is, but you can get away with more height if those, uh, those height plants had these kind of, you know, plants on a stick kind of look, right, uh, one way or the other. So some of the Ringium yucifolium, uh, which was mentioned yesterday, is a great example of that, it's Latris. Uh, the native echinaceas or uh, non-native galtonias uh, are good examples of plants that kind of poke up, but they don't really kind of uh, er erode the legibility of a short mix. Um, right now we're working at Arlington National Cemetery. It's the last expansion of the cemetery they're ever going to do. Uh, as a part of that, they're designing essentially like a whole city of columbaria because they're, they don't want to tell the last soldier they can't be buried in Arlington Cemetery. So having to think of burial techniques that aren't conventional, you know, they aren't just kind of one, one gravestone, one person. So the columbarias are essentially, you know, the niche walls that the ashes can be put into. So one of the, the challenges is they have all these uh, little garden spaces between there, and they didn't want to put turf in there because all the mowing that's going to be happening, people are going to, you know, go to the walls to have a moment with their relatives. Uh, what could they do kind of in these little spaces uh, in order to do that? Um, and so you can see the number of these little spaces in between them was a perfect example for us to use some of these kind of low one layer uh, 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 systems. So we've designed kind of a series of five different carpets that are going into the cemetery. Um, and each one's a different mix. You can see the ground covers, you can see the repetition of some of the, the themes that are in there. Visually, they want them, it's a very conservative place. They want them to be very, very low, very, very monocultural looking. But you can see the diversity of plants, even in something that's going to look very monocultural. This is one of my points. So we have you know, in, anywhere between 6 to 12 species in each mix. Um, but we've been very careful about editing. So we have some uh, mixes that are all, even where the forbs that are in there, the perennials, have a grass-like foliage coming out of grass. So that everything feels the same texture. Or other ones where everything has a broadleaf texture, you know, everything in there. So, it, so it's not like there's a fine texture of broadleaf and it feels like very chaotic. So in all these mixes, all this is to say is we can have biodiversity and still have the aesthetics of legibility that is so important in suburban landscapes. You know, that, that drives our landscapes. We want legible lines, we want clean stuff, we want to look over it. We can still have biodiversity. It doesn't have to come at the cost of that. We can design ways in which we have both and and, and that. I appreciate your attention. I, I know that went from kind of big picture to uh, a lot of little wonky details. Uh, but I, I just want to end with... Uh, uh, t talking about a trip I took a few years ago that to me was a very inspiring vision of nature in the future. Um, I had the wonderful opportunity to go plant hunting in China uh, through uh, the, the Himalayas uh, with a bunch of other designers uh, looking at plants in the wild. Um, so we went to, you know, very high up uh, in Himalayas and it was snow in the morning and all melt in the afternoon trying to see kind of these uh, plants. And it was the geekiest thing ever. We had a caravan or two or three vans and we would all slam on the brakes to the side of the road, we see a little bit of color. We'd all march out with our 50-pound cameras and, and then wait in line to take a picture of the one little uh, uh, bop of color. And we all load back in the car and drive to the next spot and do that again for, you know, we did this for three days. Uh, and we thought it was great. Uh, my wife's like, what is that? What kind of vacation is that? Um, 
yeah, and then we did, you know, did stuff like this, you know, got, kind of got our hands in these, and this is what gets me off right here. Uh, seeing that, that's um, uh, Mykonopsis. Uh, isn't that amazing? Just so huge. Uh, but one of the things that was so fascinating about this trip is I went thinking I'm going to see some of the last wilderness in the world, you know, before China's totally messed up the rest of this. Parts of the Himalayas that are very inaccessible, high elevation, these plant communities. So I'm going to have an experience of wilderness that I think is going to be really rare when the last times. Uh, here's tree peonies growing. This is really fast. Tree peonies growing like out of rock. And in garden settings, you know, they're growing in super rich soil. It's like a, I thought it was a woodland edge plant, you know, this super rich one. But this, here it is growing out of the rocky soil. This is Cassian Smit um, taking pictures of something. You can see there's tree peonies all over this. So just fascinating to see things like peonies, which I associate with kind of like the super rich garden soils growing out of the nastiest, um, most stressful uh, sheer cliffs in one way or the other. Or, or other places where just, you know, lush, lush foliage, so much of... Uh, 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 native cornice, or, or sorry, the Asian cornices and uh, Davidias uh, growing in different areas. And then some of the high elevation meadows were just so moving one way or the other. The thing that shocked me about this trip is I thought I was going to go see calendar vegetation because it was wilderness, because no one had touched it. The thing that shocked me, though, is that this looks like this and is so biodiverse because of this guy. Because Farmer Yan lets his uh, yak out to graze it, which you know, may be illegal because it's not really his property to do that. But what I assumed to be a wilderness was someone else's culture that I didn't understand. It was a cultural landscape. And, and part of what makes these things super biodiverse is because they're managing them. You know, the, the Native Americans used to burn. You know, so much of this area, we're stopping burning. We have more land, fallow land, than we've ever had uh, in, in many ways, but we're not doing the management that we used to do. We're not doing the maintenance we used to do. You know, we're not, we're not burning, we're not doing all the stuff. And so once you start doing that, our landscapes are, we're losing biodiversity because we're not doing that kind of stuff. So to me, this vision of future nature was not this kind of like, nature is this thing out there that we can't touch, that we have to keep ourselves out of. Nature needs to be gardened. Bi this, the biodiversity of this meadow, which is unbelievable, unbelievable, cannot happen without uh, an herbivore chewing it, tamping down the most competitive species in that. If, if that cow stops chewing it, it'll just re re uh, turn into a bunch of trees and shrubs. Now, that that's bad, but it wouldn't, have, it wouldn't be the biodiversity hotspot that is there. You know, so, so it is, is that vision of we still need to garden the wild. And, and we, as, you know, not only, we're, it's not just about kind of making the sun bridges of the world, not wilding those places, but it's going into the, the, the native areas we have left and understanding what is it we have to advocate for in those areas. You know, what, what management actions are needed to, to maintain the maximum biodiversity in those areas. So it is this vision of, of in the middle of this biodiversity crisis that we're in, we're, we're really having to both garden the wild and embrace our role in doing that as stewards of those, those natural areas, but also wilder gardens by using strategies, some of the ones I mentioned today, of getting more biodiversity in kind of our native and unnative uh, landscapes. I, I'm so grateful for your attention and for uh, tolerating my wonkiness. Uh, I, I, I appreciate it so much. Um, I think we have a little time for questions. Um, not a, I, I didn't leave a lot of time, but we have some time for questions. Thank you.